Is it on? Yes, it is. <laughs> Bonsoir. Uh, good evening. I have images, but they're mostly text, so, and they're a bit long, um, so I'll keep them for as long as they make sense. I'll keep them uh, up there. This pact, this contract of hospitality that links to the foreigner and which reciprocally links the foreigner is a question of knowing whether it counts beyond the individual and if it, is also, if it also extends to the family, to the generation, to the genealogy. It is not here, although the things are connected, a question of the classical problem of the right to nationality or citizenship as birthright, in some places linked to the land and in others to blood. It's not only a question of the link between birth and nationality, it's not only a question of the citizenship offered to someone who had none previously, but of the not granted to the foreigner as such, to the foreigner remaining a foreigner, and to his or her relatives, to the family, to the descendants, this familial or genealogical writing, right applying. Jack the Buddha of hospitality. What's the question? About two years ago, we learned that over one million people, mostly from Syria, but also from conflict thorn, mostly resource-rich and geoeconomically strategic key areas, had arrived in Europe. From countries such as Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Eritrea, Somalia, Nigeria, Sudan, hundreds of thousands of displaced people reached Turkey, Italy, Bulgaria, Spain, or Greece, from where they hoped to make their way into Central Europe or perhaps the UK. Such crossings have been happening for years. But back in 2015, the number of capsized boats on the Mediterranean Sea and the photo of the dead body of a Syrian child, alien Kurdi, washing ashore that went viral on social media, galvanized the attention of mainstream media, European governments, NGOs, and activists. It was a crisis. Well, how are things now, two years since the declaration of that latest European crisis? Through its member states and multilateral structures, the European Union has put in place a juridical architecture charged primarily with the management of border security. This border security infrastructure has not only reduced the number of landings in the continent, but also hindered the work of NGOs, such as Doctors Without Borders, Proactive Open Arms, CI, Save the Children, and many others. With this self-protective infrastructure, which includes outposts in the Middle East, in Turkey, North Africa, Europe seems to be managing its crisis rather well. For, as the Italian Interior Minister Marco Minici said at a news conference back in August, I quote, our goal is to govern the migration flow. A big democracy, a big country, doesn't endure migration flows, but tries to govern them. What he means is that displaced men, women, and children cannot reach southern or central Europe. They are stuck in Turkey, North Africa. Many may not even try to start the journey, or perhaps it is just that many are killed along the way where the cameras don't catch them. When considering these European crises and other texts, I have focused on the security infrastructure and highlighted the distinction between refugee protection and Europe's border protection. Europe's response, I argue, in those places, exemplifies how reality operates as a global political device whose work is to keep those displaced by the waters of global capital in the zone of violence that is outside the ethical zone, uh, the ethical scene of life. Today I'm going to be talking about the same thing, but in a, through a slightly different 
route. I'm not. I'm going to take a philosophical detour and then take off into some speculation. The detour will consist primarily of a reflection on the notions of hospitality and cosmopolitanism, which takes me to the exploration of two renderings of the ethical scene, namely the scene of law and the scene of life. After that, I'll just do some kind of what if exercise exploring another way, another point of departure for thinking, which I hope might help us to respond to the ethical demand that neither cosmopolitanism nor hospitality seems able to address, because neither attends to how this recent European crisis results from the colonial juridic economic apparatus of total violence, which global state capital needs to secure the profits only extraction can deliver. Because hospitality in this situation is not offered to an anonymous new arrival and someone who has neither name nor patronym nor family nor social status and who is therefore treated not as a foreigner but as another barbarian. We have alluded to this, the difference, one of the subtle and sometimes ungraspable differences between the foreigner and the absolute other is that the latter cannot have a name or a family name. The absolute or the conditional hospitality I would like to offer him or her presupposes a break with hospitality in the ordinary sense, with conditional hospitality, with the right to or pact of hospitality. In saying this once more, we are taking account of an irreducible pervertibility the law of hospitality, the expressed law that governs the general concept of hospitality, appears as a paradoxical law, pervertible and perverting. It seems to dictate that absolute hospitality should break with the law of hospitality as right and duty, with the pact of hospitality. To put in different terms, absolute hospitality requires that I open my home and that I give not only to the foreigner provided with a family name, with the social status of being a foreigner, etc., but to the absolute unknown, anonymous other, and that I give place to them, that I let them come, that I let them arrive, and take place in this place I offer them, without asking of them either reciprocity, entering into a pact, or even their names, the law of absolute hospitality commands a break with hospitality by right, with law or justice as right. For about 500 years, those living elsewhere on the planet have not been strangers to Europe, thanks to commercial capital and its needs for commodities, lands, and labor. For almost 200 years, racial knowledge has been assembled, has assembled tools that make them no longer foreigners, that gave them names and explained their mental capacities. Explanations which also applied back in time to justify the bloodshed necessary for conquest and enslavement. For this reason, it is interesting that the Rida chose to take duty as the ethical descriptor for hospitality and to present that figure of an absolute other, nameless, homeless, Levinas big O other, which remains without representation, to choose that figure as the one to whom absolute hospitality would apply. It is as if even the demand for legal or moral obligation to hospitality, to the racial other, is something unthinkable, unwritable, as a philosophical exercise, even though, as in, we know, when writing about hospitality, Derrida was referring to the others of Europe for whom cities of refuge ought to be built. Even as he was doing so, the ontology uh, helped as its non-commitment to external causes and consequences does not clash with the choice not to foreground coloniality. What is it about coloniality and raciality that renders them both philosophically inarticulable even when 
called for in a writing that demands hospitality towards refugees from outside of the European continent and its settler colonial satellites when it demands it as an ethical when it's as an ethical demand. So what I'm presenting today is not so much an answer but a guide for understanding the question and the provocation to do something about it. The description of my lecture says, among other things, that I will consider hospitality and cosmopolitanism in light of this European crisis, which is something that I'm going to do. But mostly, I want to have this conversation with Derrida about ethics. So I'll be going over the ethical scene of law, duty, and life, and the ethical scene of life through which I will make a case for attending to raciality while at the same time proposing that if those of us on the left are to make sense of this and the other European crisis of the global state capital to come and the other crisis of the global state capital to come, we must learn how to think otherwise. the sin of law, the duty to be free. Whatever concept one may form of the freedom of the will with the metaphysical, with the metaphysical aim, its appearances, the human actions are determined just as much as every other natural occurrence in accordance with universal laws of nature. History, which concerns itself with the narration of these appearances, however, however these appearances, however deeply concealed their causes may be, nevertheless allows us to hope from it that if it considers the play of the freedom of the human will, will in the large, it can discover within it a regular course, and that in this way what meets the eye in individual subjects as confused and irregular, yet in the whole species can be recognized as a steadily progress, as steadily progressing though slow development of its original predispositions. If you have read Kant's idea for a universal history with the cosmopolitan aim, you can appreciate the sense that, that because it is also a rational being, the moral law, the law of freedom, and not empirical laws matters when it comes to the knowledge of the human. Reading this essay published in 1784, it is difficult to miss that such framing of universal history as a perfecting process, which would end up with the realization of human predispositions as dictated by history, this framing does not challenge that basic statement about the fundamental difference between the human and other existing things. That human natural trait, rationality, and hopes will lead to the submission of human instincts, their unsociable sociality, as he calls it, even as these are presented in the political organization, the state, and would lead to the constitution of an interstate, and it would lead to the constitution of an interstate cosmopolitan order. In another famous essay on perpetual peace, in particular the, the third, uh, Def definitive article of perpetual peace, um, which I think inspired uh, Derrida's writing on hospitality, he states that, I quote, the rights of men as citizens of the world shall be limited to the conditions of universal hospitality, end quote, that is, quote, of the claim of a stranger entering foreign territory to be treated by its owner without hostility so long as he conducts himself peaceably, he must not be treated as an enemy. It is not a right to be treated as, an, uh, to be treated as a guest to which the stranger can lay claim, but he has a right to visitation." End quote. For Kant, this is a law of nature, and I'll quote again. It belongs to all mankind in virtue of our common rights of possession on the surface of the earth on which, as it is a globe, we cannot be infinitely scattered and must be in the end, and must in the end reconcile ourselves to existence side by side. At the same time, originally, no one individual had more right than another to live in any one particular spot." End quote. 
precisely this right which may lead those who live far away come in relations with each other, he says, may, and I quote again, may at last come under the public control of law and thus the human race may be brought nearer to the realization of a cosmopolitan constitution, end quote. From the circumstances of existing within the limits of a sphere, Kant postulated that a, nat a natural right which as a human race for its positions developing over time, would or could eventually come under positive law in a cosmopolitan order. This construction, I think, responds for the Derrida's description of hospitality in the juridic political scene. But I'm not sure now, and I may become later, that it supports the writing of hospitality in the ethical scene of moral law. I'm skeptical for two reasons. One, which I cannot elaborate now, has to do with how this right to visitation is connected with the right to possession, which I think is a competing right to be decided by positive law. The other has to do with Kant's moral law itself and with how it is not contingent on anything imminent other than the human natural attribute of also being a rational thing at least, and least of all, the actual conditions of existing on a finite sphere, one which is now, which is now not a site of operation, which is, which is not a site of operation of the laws of nature, but which has been mapped by reality as a modern surface of signification. So I had a whole long section on the groundworks, uh, groundwork for the metaphysics of morals that I am skipping. And I'm just jumping to uh, page 13. So after the description of um, the scene of law and duty, which I basically cut short because I lost my patience with the moral law already, but we can talk about it. Later, if you want, I just I already gave all its of its uh, important aspects to my com to my point here. So I'll move to the scene of life, the historic and the organic. Okay, so basically, in this, as you can see, in this quote. Um, which is from Phenomenology, Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel is talking about a particular moment of observing reason when it encounters the thing as a living thing. And at, at the beginning, um, he's talking about primarily how, um, in, in terms of the notion of the thing in general and how it, it preserves life, and then in the second part, uh, by the end of the quote, which is what interests me more, he's mentioning how in that moment, because self-consciousness is still working with um, as uh, the understanding, it misses the fact that what it sees, the end, uh, the or the final cause it sees in the organic is also something that defines itself as one as a mechanism for the actualization of spirit, which he describes as a living thing. Um, so I'm not reading the quote because um, they are translating directly what I'm, my summary. So I'm going to move to Cuvier's now. Natural history has a principle in which to reason, which is peculiar to it, which it employs adventurously on many occasions it is that the conditions of existence commonly termed final causes. As nothing can exist without concurrence of those conditions which render its existence possible, the component parts of each must be so arranged as to render possible the whole living being, not only with regard to itself, but to its surrounding relations. And the analysis of these conditions frequently conducts to general laws as demonstrable as those which are derived from calculation and experiment. 
It is only when the laws of general physics and those which result from the conditions of existence are exhausted that we are reduced to the simple laws of observation. And then I have this other quote from Hegel in which um, basically he describes uh, the notion of the state and the notion of uh, the spirit of a people and refers to the fact that all that we identify with morality and arts are part of the spirit of a people. In any event, what these quotes highlight is how the organic figures in the historic version Hegel's and the scientific version Cuvier's of life. In both Hegel's phenomenology of spirit and Cuvier's The Animal Kingdom, the human guides descriptions of the world as history and nature that is in time and space as evidence of its ends and fin or final causes. My interest, my interest here is in how both Hegel's and Cuvier's rendering of life in the register of the final causes are constitutive, constitutive of the ethical scene of life and also, of course, in how these are distinct from the Kantian ethical scene of moral law or duty, which for Derrida provides the one sense of hospitality he does not find adequate. To repeat myself a bit, Cuvier's scientific rendering of the scene of life governs the racial grammar that sustains the indistinction between protection and self-preservation in the case of those whose arrival has led to the announcement of that European crisis. The scene is obviously even more complex as, in addition to the racial grammar, in the past year or so, we are witnessing the resurfacing of an anti-refugee racist nationalist discourse which combines Hegel's historic nation and the pre-enlightenment meanings of the nation, of nation and race, which the one that belongs to the symbolics of blood and soil. When commenting on observing reason in the quote, In the quote above, Hegel describes self-consciousness before it recognizes its essential fundamental connection to everything else, which it will find late it will find later in the book, resides in spirit or transcendental reason as freedom. But I have chosen to use it to, to open this section with this with this quote. Um, Precisely because this passage, in this passage, Hegel provides a description of the organic, of life itself, in which he postulates that its ethical import stands to the thing beyond the human, it goes beyond the human alone. What for Hegel is still an early moment of reason's development, however, for Cuvier was a cause for celebration. Lamenting that natural history's objects were numerous, various, and fragile, and that did not allow for, I quote, rigorous, rigorous calculation. Rigorous calculation. In the passage quoted, he celebrates, uh, Cuvier celebrates precisely that which Hegel found a lack in deployment of reason, which is that observation and analysis of the parts and movements of the living bodies in nature and the analysis of their conditions of existence. I quote, Frequent, frequently conducts to general laws as demonstrable as those which are de derived from calculation and experiment, end quote. So both versions of life would inform the post-enlightenment thinking, in particular the scientific projects assembled in the 19th century, such as the science of man and society. And I'm jumping again, I'm skipping all the way to page 19. In what could be read as explorations of that which in Kant appears as whole, Hegel and Cuvier provide elaborations of the notion of the human as a subject presented as a collective entity. 
which unfolds in time, in the historical transcendent theological time of spirit of a nation, and in, in the scientific immanent finite of the body of the human species. Existing in time, these two figurings of the human differ from the constant formal presentation of the human being and of humanity. Then that is what I, what I skipped from the groundwork. Historical and scientific reason to term the human as an immanent unity of a multiplicity, something Kant would not do as his humanity insofar as it is an attribute of existing individuals, refers to the ration, their being rational things, and as such to their pertaining in the realm of ends, the home place of reason and freedom. Now, on the other hand, Hegel's nation spirits is a collective but particular moment of development of spirit in its trajectory, which is human history. On the other hand, each member of the human species, the one whose organs and functions are mapped by comparative anatomy and revolution, are placed at apex in the code for knowing everything else has ever made part of nature. As I have demonstrated elsewhere, the arsenal of raciality becomes both necessary and possible after these two writings of the human did two things. The Hegelian opened the possibility that the difference between Europe and the rest would eventually dissipate as spirit followed its self-actualizing trajectory, and the science of life finally articulated a concept, that of life itself, that allowed for the deployment of scientific reason in the production of knowledge of human conditions, something I did not find necessary or desirable. But my point here is that the organic names both the human and the world, which it captures as the work site of the human in the ethical scene of life. I will return to that word at the end. Now I will just focus on the human. Each articulation of life produces a mode of naming the human as a moral collective. On the one hand, the historic rendering of life as articulated in the notion of nation yields proper names and, refer, and, ref, and refers to other places, languages, modes of lives, which would correspond to the ones Derrida finds in the juridic political notion of hospitality. On the other hand, the scientific rendering of life articulated in the tools of raciality, also yields names in the form of categories, black, African, Europe, white, Indian, American, Asian, etc., which, which do not correspond to the names, to the ones that it defines in the juridical political notion of hospitality. More importantly, these terms, names, or name, sorry, these terms name other human collectives and the cultural moral traits such to be signified in their bodies, which renders them neither the absolute other nor the neighbor nor a relative European descendants in the Americas, the Pacific, elsewhere. For this reason, neither of the figurings of hospitality that we proposed adequately describes the ethical demand from the racial order of Europe. Named by the authority of the tools of European scientific knowledge of life, these foreigners blamed, by this latest, blamed for this latest European crisis ask a different question. Before the question of the foreigner as a theme, the title of a problem, program of research, before assuming in this way that we already know what the foreign is, foreigner is, what the foreigner means, and who the foreigner is, even before that, there was, of course, the question of the foreigner as the question the man addressed to the foreigner. Who are you? Where do you come from? What do you want? Do you want to come? Or are you getting, what are you getting at, etc. But above all, even earlier, the question of the foreigner as a question comes from abroad, and thus of the response of responsibility. How should one respond to all these questions? How be responsible for them? How answer for oneself when faced with them, when faced with the questions that are so many demands and even prayers? In what language can the foreigner address his or her question, receive ours? In what language can he or she be interrogated? 
So what I'll be doing here is I'll be proposing a kind of speculative groundwork that starts and I think it stays a bit underground. But I am still operating in the mode of the Kantian critique. So my main goal here is to say that we have to let go of the modern metaphysics and the descriptions of the human and the world it authorizes. We need to ask other questions about existence and try to come up with descriptions that do not presuppose, predict, or reproduce violence, which, as I said elsewhere, has been systematically, consistently, and effectively written as the distinguishing feature of the others of Europe. So, what the world and its inhabitants are facing now is a European crisis, or maybe two European crises, climate change and population displa displacement. Now these crises are also a crisis of the mode of thinking that has been created for and is supportive of extraction. So what we need to do is to go after extraction, address its injustice. One a first task I find is to assemble descriptions of the world which do not presuppose neither the scene of life, both the historic and the scientific, nor the scene of law. The task is as much an ethical as it is an epistemological one, because exploding the infrastructure of thought and thinking and seeking other tools for describing the world is what will take, I think, to attend the ethical demand made by the racial orders of Europe, which is nothing else than the end of the world as we know it, or decolonization. Now, talking about the end of the world, so I will talk about the other crisis, which is climate change, which is the rise in Earth's average temperature. So when talk, talking about climate change, however, we, all we do is to talk about the human, about human action, about how human actions are leading to a temperature rise that can will cause the destruction or extinction of human and other living things. Both the food we eat and the fossil fuel consumed by our vehicles have been named culprits in this deadly flow. Global warming is about heat, that is, it's about a kind of transfer of energy. <coughs> the form that it's called internal energy, or more precisely, heat is the transfer of the kinetic energy generated by collisions of the constituents of a given existent. Heat flows from flash to flash by contact, radiation, or mediation. Every existent emits electromagnetic radiation as long as it's, it is its temperature which is a measure of the average internal temperature, is greater than absolute zero, which, as far as I have learned, has only been achieved through the intervention of scientists in the lab. Heat, internal kinetic energy, which depends on mass and speed, like any other form of energy, can be transformed into another form of energy. There are several kinds of energy, potential, kinetic, thermal, nuclear, elastic, and many others. So the first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be transferred and transformed. Now, when I frame it scientifically as the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy takes some authority from all the kinds of knowledge I was mentioning before, which it would not carry had I introduced it by the way of Empedocles postulate that all that exists is but a recomposition of the four elements, air, fire, water, and earth, which is how it interests me. So lately I've been interested in exploring what becomes of thinking when it starts from and stays with the elemental as it appears in the pre-Socratic Greek, Chinese, Hindu thought, to name a few. So let me start with uh, a little bit of the speculation here. And that speculation will be around the term Anthropocene. Basically, when we, are talk we talk about 
the Anthropocene, or we're talking about climate change. We talk about finite human organic time. But we usually ignore how that finite human organic time already maps the, the, the surface of the Earth. So just think for a minute about how this, the phases of Earth are named. The existing techniques and tools set Earth age at about 4.6 billion years. But the first 600 million years are not yet officially named. I'm not sure why, but I guess this is because it lacks the kind of evidence that allowed for the officially naming the other 4 billion years, which is the layer where when microfossils of oxygen-producing bacteria were found. There's, of course, much to be said about this in distinction between place, time, space that goes in the name. I'm not prepared to say much more than that this kind of description already describes the planet with, a procedure, with procedures of a particular kind of knowledge, which, as I described before, was consolidated in the 19th century in Cuvier and then also in Darwin's writings of life or of the scene of the organic, or the scientific scene of the organic. Two consequences of this deployment are relevant here. First, which is, um, I have already mentioned, the classificatory system designed in the 19th century already presumed that the human organism form governs, and it is the model and the most perfect living formation, the understanding of the forms and functions of other living things. And second, and consequently, that when used by geologists, it deploys the human formation onto the surface of the Earth. So when critics of the Anthropocene charge it uh, of anthropocentrism, it seems late, a late gesture which does not quite get to the root of the problem. And I'm skipping, I'm skipping to the bottom of the page. Um, so what I want to highlight now is how this modern, that how, sorry. So what I want to highlight now is the fact that we have to let go of this uh, modern metaphysics and its pillars, which I also discuss, discuss elsewhere, and I'll just name them here, separability, determinacy, and sequentiality, and we have to let go of it because this kind of knowing, this metaphysics, both requires and reproduces the separation of what's known through an identification of two sets of causes, namely efficient, the cause of the observable appearance of and or change to something, and formal cause, the cause, the names to be given to that thing once the intrinsic causes for change and or its, its specific properties of the, its appearance are determined. Hence, the unofficial phases, layers of the planet are so because they cannot be separated according to the living things, which are on their turn, turn knowable because the different degrees of complexity of their organisms allow for the determination of their genera and species, etc which on its turn allows for, especially after Cuvier's comparative anatomy would combine with Darwin's uh, evolution, the establishing of their place in a temporal sequence that charts the development of life, which as, figuring, which, as a figuring of Hegel's spirit is both the efficient and final cause that accounts for the particularity of the parts and movements of living things. So what I'm proposing, and it's just, just a proposal because I have had to do the work, um, and even if I had, I wouldn't have time to share it with you here, is that we take advantage of climate change, that other crisis, and engage in a kind of radical thinking that may provide us with an ethical basis for demanding the kind of juridic and economic changes necessary to challenge the dominance of state capital, and shift gears away from extraction of lands and resources, the extraction which results in the displacement, dispossession, and death, death that forces the racial orders of Europe to come and be blamed by that other European crisis. 
Following the suggestion from critics such as Haraway, Morton, and others, I take the Anthropocene as an invitation to re-engage in critical radical thinking, starting with heat, as I did, the transfer of kinet internal kinetic energy. I propose that instead of focusing on the human anthropos as the efficient cause of global warming, we could highlight extraction and the juridical coloniality and symbolic racialty modes of deployment of power that facilitate it. Even if we don't have a good grasp of what is at work in global warming, we know that it has to do with the emission and accumulation of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, which has raised the temperature of the lower layer of the of Earth's uh, atmosphere, which is the troposphere. From what I understand, this rise in temperature results from these gases absorption and emission of infrared radiation. Now, the increased accumulation of gases above uh, Earth has to do basically with an increased extraction of matter from Earth in the form of fossil fuels and soil nutrients to feed crops and livestock. The accumulation of gases then is inseparable from the exploitation of land and labor necessary for accessing fossil fuel and soil. Whether we located its efficient cause earlier with the emergence of agriculture or in the, or in the later 18th, late 18th century with the Industrial Revolution, there is no question that a certain concentration of means of production and of access to raw materials responds for the excess of greenhouses house gases. I don't need to say much to support the point that coloniality is a mode of governance that relies on total violence to ensure expropriation of internal energy of lands and bodies. I don't have to say much to show that coloniality facilitated and still facilitates this concentration. So if that's the case, it is not unreasonable to point to the fact that the accumulation of these gases also expresses the extent and intensity of the degree of concentration of expropriated internal kinetic energy facilitated by coloniality and the juridic economic mechanisms state capital deployed in the past two centuries, centuries or so. So there's so much to be said about the intensity and the extent of this expropriation of internal energy, but I will just recall the facts of concentration, such as the levels of dispossession found in the global south and the never-ending wars in the African continent and Middle East, Afghanistan. Conflicts which, wars which are but colonial conflicts which don't interfere with extraction of natural resources. What do I propose in face of this European crisis? With Empedocles then, it is possible to think that we, to think the present global conditions without the pillars of modern thought, which would only reinscribe the human man exceptionality as the supreme efficient and formal cause at work in the world. By taking the elements as descriptors of matter, it is possible to assemble a kind of material thinking that describes the world and each thing on it, of it, as a singular composition that expresses everything else in a unique way. Each element would then be a mode of appearance of such composition, not as a discrete entity, but in a manner similar to the face of matter that is, like water, liquid, air, gas, earth, solid, fire, plasma. For instance, in the same way, we can easily think of the carbon monoxide emitted by our car engines and synthesized by plants as a gaseous form of the planktons that constitute petroleum. We can think of nitrous uh, oxide emitted by the sugar plantations of the colonial period and the soil plantations for biofuel in today's Brazil as a gaseous form of the internal energy of the soil and the bodies of the yesterday slaves and today's day laborers and yesterday natives. Heat is useful here, of course, because it names transfer of internal energy without suggesting that something becomes something else in the process or loses some of its attributes in the process. Heat merely names the mechanism, I guess, through which one can trace the transformation of what has been extracted from mineral or oil into gasoline, into money, into cars, into vacations, and so on. Whatever shape it takes, has taken, will take, solid, liquid, gas, plasma. What has been extracted through colonial force, the eternal energy, for instance, of Native Americans and Afro, African slaves, 
The law of conservation of energy reminds us that it remains in as global capital and the means of production and raw materials it uses for self-reproduction, that is, for accumulation. Several things follow from there, including a shift from a concern with destruction to one with the conversion of other forms of energy expropriated from native lands, enslaved bodies, fossil fuel. Also, instead of talking about extinction, we could focus on transformation in how the accumulated wealth as well as climate change have been made possible by coloniality and raciality. Focusing on Sorry. Focusing on violence would shift. Focusing on, um, on violence would shift our conversation about climate change and the arrival of refugees in a few ways. One, uh, it would displace the human and privilege how racialism configures humanity. It would displace. It would, it would still center the global, the planet, Earth, and its inhabitants. But it would also allow for the colonial critique of state capital that supports the claim for the return, the reconversion of the kinetic energy and work expropriated from the soil and the bodies of the others of Europe who would then no longer be in need of hospitality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise, uh, for that very uh, dense and very interesting um, argument that you presented. We had a reading group earlier, and I know some of the people who were at the reading group had questions, um, and a discussion had started that uh, we could continue, um, uh, or some of the people who have come along for the talk tonight may have questions. So anyone who would like to? jump in with the first question. Shall we go to some other questions from the reading group in that case? Um, Nicole, shall I hand over to you? Uh, or you? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I think also because it was, oh, yeah, clearly yeah. such a um, <laughs> um, uh, concentrated presentation, it takes a moment to think. Mm. Before we spoke about hospitality, and yeah, we said we we're gonna keep on with this. And yeah, there's on the one hand, we were dealing with this metaphor of climate change, which is very interesting, and in a way, very different to the text I've read from you, uh, which is nice because it's the offering of a possibility in a way rather than just, yes, staying on the critique and the criticality and this radical thinking, so it's a possibility. So what we were saying, uh, and what I, the question is, was what would, regarding self-direction, like what would be the effect of this change taking place, which I think would reconfigure the idea of the other, and in a way could also affect self-direction and means of production. Um, what would be... So the, the core of the question, if you could just repeat it, what would be the, the shift or...? Yeah, uh, it would be like how self-direction would be affected by this shift in this idea of understanding change and climate change would, I think, would radically affect the idea of an other, because in a way, as I saw in a, in a motto the other day, there is no planet B. <laughs> so what they are saying is it's a finite space, and 
there is not this, this idea of infinite. So we do, as Derrida says, have to find a way of being all together. Yeah, which is also what uh, Immanuel Kant said when he's writing about um, the cosmopolitan order and the, the and universal hospitality. But I, I let me just uh, actually say something because I was a bad guest and I didn't thank Kathleen and Elaine for bringing me here <laughs> to be part of this. <laughs> um, so I want to be a better guest. Thank you. <laughs> um, so beautiful, it's amazing um, exhibition. So, yeah, that's a problem, isn't it? Because I think, um, so that is a way in which the planet, the planet is finite, um, but that is also a way in which, uh, precisely because of conservation of energy, we, existence is not finite, neither temporarily, not spatially, right? Because it's all, um, you know, all the, 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 the little particles that constitute everything around us, they have been around for a long time and they will continue to be around for a long time. So whether you take it from the cosmic perspective or the quantic perspective, um, our, our limited way, finite way of looking at space and time is actually bad, it's, it's, uh, it's limited. So it is a problem because if we do that, if we, if we go from the, the quantic to the cosmic, then uh, I think every term, concept, category that we have, um, that have been assembled with either with the, the, the figuring of time in the organic as life or in the figuring of the historical time, um, those will be no longer necessary in a way. Because in a way, I think those, those terms that come from this philosophical tradition, they are, they are attempting to, to deal with a problem, the question, of, the question of man, right? The question of the, the man, meaning the question, the, the question that European, European philosophy posed itself in the, 15th, in the 16th century, not the 15th, the 16th century, which is a question that he, it, man had to deal with it, its finitude, that unfortunately it wasn't really quite the divine, right? Because it was stuck here. And, um, but that's only a problem if we think, if we share in, in, in his desire for being self-determined sovereign and um, that which des defines everything else around it, around him. Um, so yeah, so the other, the I, the, the, you know, the, the notion of, yeah, the, the, if once the self-determination goes away, of course the other also goes away, so parability goes away. Um, that the indistinction becomes true. Um, so I think it's lots of work for our imagination how, how we would go about, about that. Thank you very much, Denise, for, for this amazing um, lecture. I'm sorry because I missed a little bit the beginning. Um, but I thought it was interesting to, or maybe it would be interesting to hear a little bit more um, uh, about the proposition that you make about hospitality at the end. Um, in what ways could, you know, could uh, uh, the human collectives and non-human collectives and entities beyond our visions and so on that constitute this planet, in what way could we, or, or what way do you see um, uh, this uh, hospitality also as a term that, for example, the Afrofuturist um, worked on as a you know, mothership, uh, the notion of mothership, uh, it was much more science fiction employed in, in that, uh, in, of course, the, the, future, the past uh, myths and myth mythologies. But this hospitality has always also been somehow present in, in more like spiritual practices in relation to the earth as something that is hospitable uh, to us and to life. So uh, I, I guess you were going in, in this direction, but I wanted to, and I have another question after. So I think, so, uh, thank you, Natasha, <laughs> the question. So I think, um, 
And betting on that hospitality itself would not be necessary if we just assume that we are not strangers or foreigners, right? That we are just, you know, another composition, uh, a different, a different composition. Um, now, so there are two ways of going. Unfortunately, I will have to make that distinction. Unfortunately, I have to make it. I don't like to make it, but I'm forced to. Two ways of going about it. Um, thinking about this, what, how is it that we live in the world as, uh, we do not live in the world, right? We, it's like, there is no distinction, really. Like, we it exist, just think in terms of existence. So we can go the spiritual final cause way of talking about it. And, and in a way, I, I know that every time we're talking about ethics, that's where we go, because that's how we, we have come to think about it. So we go in the final causes, the, um, along the spiritual ways. But I don't like it because that becomes something to come, right? Two things. Number one, it's something to come. It's something to come. It's not here yet, um, so it, but it holds us to it. And yet, it's supposed to come, meaning it's supposed to come in space-time and become here. So that's one problem I have there. Or maybe it's something to come that we go after we die, right? That's it. Somehow it is something that is in time. So what I'm trying to do, and I don't know if I'll be able to do it the way I think I could do, is to, to do the, the other way and really try some kind of, to design some kind of ethical program even though it may not be a program, that it's material, that is already, um, that is already here, that it's, and so it's already here, it's already now, because here and now is just, again, a recomposition of those material things for which we have different names, but names that uh, primarily separate them we, uh, or explain their relationship. Um, so then that would, I think that's, so much work to be done towards that. I don't even, I don't, um, I don't pretend that I even know uh, what, you know, all the, even half of the elements of the parts of the work to be done. So that's why I'm just calling it a speculation and being very comfortable in this, it is metaphysical in a way, right? It is metaphysical. Um, and uh, and I'm fine just doing that because I don't I, I don't know and I think we, we don't know but I but I think it is um, we need to start the work uh, by asking what if questions that so what if we think the world otherwise what if we think uh, materially so what kinds of demands become possible so even the, at the end the demand for reconversion which is the uh, the demand for the return, of course it becomes possible once you eliminate those separations. So it's not a totally crazy proposition, right? But um, not that crazy is bad, but it's, um, yeah, so I don't know. I think my answer to your question is I don't know. I can or, map it. we don't know where to start, basically. Yeah, yeah. I can map the ways, the different ways, but yeah. Thank you so much. I don't have another question, maybe later. Yeah. Hi, Denise. Um, and you use a lot of um, matter, of, of philosophic matter to, for your own presentation. And for me, there was a kind of contradiction in between the, the way you open that subject and the way you try to reopen it at the end. That's that, in, in certain way, the philosophy try to, to catch something, to name something, to describe, organize, several things, several what is me and what is not me. And the other method that we try to open is more, I think, as that speculative method that we are talking about, is using that storytelling that for me is the exactly opposite method of the philosophic uh, the quotation you did. That means that it's not a way to catch, but a way to, to play with, to try to create some, uh, uh, some kind of assemblage, some kind of animation, animate things, 
and so not considering that you are outside of the world that you are able to describe, that you are played by and you are played with, uh, that kind of matter, that means that it can come back to the idea of, of the Hida from the beginning that with the unnaming person, things, phenomenon, but it comes it come a kind of global uh, universe with the unnamed phenomenon that we have to try to play with. And so it, it's really, uh, for me, um, it probably, for me it's something, something really uh, with a lot of tension that you use at the beginning, that tool of philosophy, that seems to be totally decontract by the method you open at the end. I know, um, so I was, I had this, I spent uh, quite some time trying to figure out how I want to do the philosoph the philosophy part and then I thought, so maybe s since I can use PowerPoint, and even that I wasn't sure until very, uh, two, hours, two hours ago I think, I told Elida that I was going to use the PowerPoint because I, want, I wanted to hang there uh, as a reference for me to talk about something else. And I think the, the, the first part, which is the longer part of the paper, it's primarily about why, I mean, it's primarily about mapping the very conditions from which I can begin to talk about something else. Um, that, and then something else that came up uh, during the, the conversation with the, the reading group, which is also I am uh, very much committed in, and I still want to invest in critique and in this very kind of like old fashioned, I think, content critique. And I want, to, I want to do that, but I want to do something else at the same time. Um, because, yeah, because I think I like, the tension allows me to get away with things that if I was, were to do one or the other thing, I wouldn't be able to, to it wouldn't work. Uh, and I know that it also, um, it creates texts that are difficult to follow, not because they're difficult, but because the, the text doesn't give itself up all the way. You have to go back and look at how, how it comes together. But, but it is also playing with the method, with co composition and recomposition itself. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's a, and there's quite a bit of uh, experimentation going, going on in, in here. But I'm, I want to become more and more comfortable with, uh, with experimentation. And then, of course, presenting such a space it, it allows for it, and uh, as Catherine and Elaria were showing me the, uh, the different pieces in the exhibition, I just felt so at home. And I felt at home because I had this, I could see, okay, so I'm speaking to different things in the different uh, words, and I also felt at home because there's quite a bit of text to, in the exhibition. And I thought, okay, so I'm, in a way, it may be, it may be that in order to to address um, the effects of coloniality, raciality, and of the extraction that's bringing about uh, climate change, maybe we need to also create those tensions, in, in, especially in the space, right? I mean, the the, the talk talk and the and the and the and the work, but then that is an indistinction between. Um, between them, which is also necessary. Maybe that's how, what we have to do because we cannot take anything for granted. That's what I feel with, uh, both with using my props, my quotes as props, and with the texts around the work. You cannot take it for granted that what it's in there, it's in there, like, you know, if you're, you know, like the, the if, if the work is up to be approached by uh, a subject, the subject of the critique of judgment, that is, of critique of judgment, there is no way they would make sense of the, the word. Um, so I see the words um, and the work in a way like similar to how I do my uh, assemblage of the text itself. Um, not as the same thing, but it's, it's similar. Any other final questions? I was more, um, uh, yeah, maybe a, because of this very important um, question of coloniality and raciality and their, um, let's say, this um, colonialist drive of part of uh, human civilization, 
uh, throughout the history and this uh, importance of naming this as one of the causes of uh, what's happening with the carbon emissions. I think this was really, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite recent, I believe. Uh, it came also a little bit through the, one of the proposal by, I think it was Lewis, and another scientist who proposed that the Anthropocene should be dated with the entrance to the, um, yeah, with the, um, with the starting of um, uh, genocide and uh, introducing of viruses in the Americas, as well as then everything that, uh, uh, I mean, the, the centuries of slavery that brought materially again um, uh, as, as conditions for this behavior to, to be happening. So I thought that was very, I think it's, it's a very important uh, critique in the, in the discourse of Anthropocene that we see uh, happening, finally. Uh, so thank you also for, of course, for, for bringing that. And um, uh, I also, in, in that respect, I was, um, I was very um, moved by, um, it's, so it's less a proposal, it's more a critique by Australian, anthrop Lebanese Australian anthropologist, Hassan Hajj, who wrote recently this book uh, called Is Racism an Environmental Threat? where he, he, he was actually alarmed um, in Australia by the analogy in which um, the, uh, the, in the mass media the refugees are referred to with the same terms as toxic waste. So they use the similar terms, they use similar um, language, uh, like similar names, and he, he goes deep into the history of accumulation and to show where these analogies come from, and he fo focuses them more, uh, more closely on Europe, uh, the recent uh, refugee flows, and Islamophobia. So, as this kind of ungovernable waste, which toxic waste is. So, but he, I don't think he has a proposal, or he, maybe he's working on it. But um, yeah, and I maybe I wanted to just share this with you. Yes, I, uh, yeah, I did not know about uh, about the work, but it makes sense. Yeah, tracing the language is um, it's very important because in this case the language is telling and it's telling it's telling of the history that we uh, so consistently forget, isn't it? So um, one of the things that I, I thought about talking about, uh, which obviously I did not, was, so the climate refugees, right? a large number of folks who are being displaced, they're being displaced by that cycle. So it's again like if that telling, it's another term that gives you, that tells you the, of the fundamental connection between, um, between the extraction, which, because it's an extraction of life, especially talking about petroleum, it's an extraction of life, of life that it's been on the planet from its very beginning, right? Of plankton, it's been there for such such a long time. But it's an extraction of life that goes through uh, the destruction of life, create more of the soil that is again to be extracted. So the vicious, the, this vicious circle is telling because it doesn't, the categories cannot comprehend and separate them once you start talking about it. Uh, it is as if it, it, it just unfolds. Because once you follow, you follow that thread, because you follow a thread that does not need, does not uh, respect any kind of geographical or historical boundary, then you find, you find that th those connections uh, at every different moment, including in the language that it's used uh, in the description. So when I thought about heat, I was thinking about the, mig the flow, the migration flow. Um, so it, I was reading, okay, the flow, the flow, the flow. There is no flow. This is one planet. There is no flow. So it, and then heat came to me. Okay, so that is another way of talking about it. So if I begin by talking about heat, then I'm talking, it's a different kind of flow. It's a flow that doesn't, that means that it's flowing th through, uh, whether through a mediator, whether by contact or radiation, um, it is it is here. So it's um, it's it's very interesting how how the worst 
deployment, the, the, the worst storms and, and statements, in may, many times give you, they give you precisely without what you wish to undo the thread. But then you have to go, um, yeah, have to shift the perspective. Because one of the problems, and uh, it just made me think about how um, in Brazil, the, the politicians, actually because we were discussing nobodies, not talking about uh, the kids uh, involved in the drug trafficking in the favelas, as if they were like the dengue mosquito, uh, so they were to be exterminated. And that also gave me, how do I write about racial violence? That was the point of departure. That, that, that analogy gave away, um, to me, absolutely everything about racial violence and police. Uh, brutality, not only in Brazil, but in, in other places, so, yeah. So I'm going to look for the text now. <laughs> Thank you. Unless anyone has a final question, uh, we might leave it there and thank Denise very, very much for the discussion and her presentation.